Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to keep my bit very short, and then let's start talking about data. And I'll just talk a little bit about Via and the vision behind it. Um, so we, we we believe that we are in the in the midst of a pretty dramatic transformation in the transportation space overall, and um, something that hasn't happened for about 100 years. So if you think about it, 100 years ago, we took the, if you will, the, the power source, the energy source for our uh, main mode of transportation, which was the horse, and we replaced it with the internal combustion engine. And it was a pretty rapid uh, transformation. And today what we're doing is we're taking the control layer, uh, if you will, that's currently done by humans, and we're replacing that with machines. And there are various levels at which we're replacing that control layer. So we all think about autonomous vehicles, which are probably the last piece, and that's the actual driving of the vehicle that's going to get replaced. But there are many other layers, like just deciding where to go to and, and how to navigate there and the routing. And if you ran, ran taxi business, uh, how to dispatch the taxi to different uh, passengers. And so we, we believe that what we're able to now create is, is an automated control layer that will enable uh, a whole class or a network of on-demand shuttles and that those on-demand shuttles are going to rule the way we get around. They're going to be shared, they're going to be dynamic, all the routes will be dynamic. Uh, they'll be electric, not so much our business, but a big part of it, and, uh, and eventually autonomous. And, and that's sort of how we think about the future. Um, and in that future, what we are creating is, is that layer of software that allows us to control these, uh, these on-demand shuttles. So we, we don't work on the piece that allows individual vehicles to drive themselves safely, the, the autonomous piece, but everything else above that is sort of how we think about what VIA does. So our system, if you haven't used it, um, I believe we have a, a, a code that we can give you afterwards so you can get a discount. Uh, uh, but um, it, it's on demand, um, so you, you, you book a ride on your smartphone, uh, pretty similar to Uber, Lyft, and so forth. Uh, we, we pick you up within minutes. Our average wait times in New York are about five or six minutes. Um, and the ride is al almost always shared. So uh, over 80% of the time during rush hours, over 97% of the time, you're going to be sharing with at least one other person, typically three, four, or more people. And, uh, and the routing is fully dynamic. And just to give you a little bit of sense of scale, um, so we, we believe we've created this sort of the first on-demand uh, shuttle network, uh, this operating scale. We've done over 10 million rides, 12 million rides, about a quarter of a million rides a week. Um, and then uh, just so you can sort of see a few of the other numbers. And the other thing that we're doing is we're taking this, um, this software, which we like to think of it as an operating system, which all of these shuttles can run, and we're starting to not only operate our own networks, which we operate in Chicago, New York, and DC, but also license it to third parties. So that could be public transit authorities, uh, cities, other uh, ride-hailing operations who want to add a shared option, large transit contractors, and so forth. And we have uh, a license, licensing deals in Paris and England uh, and other places around the world. Um, so with that, I, I will let's start talk to you a little bit about the data that we're using. And, and, and really what we've, we've, what we think about Via is we've taken this uh, very uh, real world problem of transportation and transformed it into uh, a pretty interesting math problem. Thanks. So, so in order to enable us uh, enable this transportation uh, operating system, we kind of break the problem to uh, three main parts. One is the real-time routing, right? Someone requests a ride from here to there, where are my vehicles, which vehicle is the best one that would pick them up, how do I do it in the most efficient way? Uh, and that's, uh, that's really interesting. And there's the two additional problems that you have to solve in order to actually run the whole thing as a business. Uh, you have pricing and demand management, right? How much should someone pay for, for a ride from here to there? And then there's the inventory management or, or, or supply planning, which is making sure that we actually have enough cars, uh, enough vehicles, drivers showing up at the right time, going to the right place, vehicles of the right, uh, of the right kind, with the right capacity, so that we can enable them afterwards to actually work efficiently when they work in real time. Um, so how do we do that? So again, everything is broken down by parts, so we can look at uh, one thing at a time. So the real-time routing is actually solving a very, very complex uh, optimization problem, right? It's kind of the, it's a real-time, dynamic, uh, traveling salesperson problem or price collecting traveling salesperson problem. Uh, and that's, um, and, and, and what I have here is not the, the formulation of the actual algorithm that we solve, because the formulation of the problem is actually half the, the, the solution, and the solution approach is half of the rest. So this is out of an MIT paper that was published earlier this year, uh, and they're solving a similar problem and with a somewhat maybe similar approach, 
But basically, uh, it's, a, it's a really, to, to anyone who's ever done any computational complexity analysis, a traveling salesperson problem is a really hard problem to solve, especially in real time. Uh, the pricing and demand management is something that uh, we solve in a very simple way uh, right now, and most of the history of VS so far, the price has been just fixed. So it's a $5 flat fee uh, for, for, for rides within Manhattan during daytime. And uh, so, so I'm an economist by training. As an economist, this is the most puzzling problem uh, ever. How come things have the same price even though they have different costs and different demands and stuff like that? I almost did my dissertation on it, but it was too weird, so I left it. Um, <laughs> but but uh, but that's a, the so we're not going to talk a lot about that because in terms of like data, this is not very interesting. There's a lot of data, but it's all the same number, so so it's not that interesting. Uh, what is interesting, or at least what I think is interesting, so I'll talk about today, is the inventory management and supply planning problem and how do you actually get enough vehicles of the right type to show up uh, tomorrow at the right place. Um, and, and, and the key to solving it is basically, the question that we ask is, how much should we offer our drivers tomorrow? Or, or you know, it's a reduction of the problem, but that's the core one. And it's a, if, if you, Think about what our, uh, and that's already something that uh, also separates us from our competitors, because if you think about what our competitors are doing, they're striving to be kind of uh, intermediaries in a marketplace for driving services, in a, in, in, a, in a spot market for driving services. They don't plan pricing in advance, they don't do any of that. They kind of solved matching demand and supply in real time by mechanisms like surge or bliss pricing or whatever like that. What we do is something different. Uh, we kind of think about it as uh, participating in a, in, a futures, uh, in a futures market. So what we do is we set the, the, the rates and the promotions to our drivers in a way that we think will uh, bring enough of those drivers at the right time, uh, enough of drivers of the right types the following day. So we actually commit uh, a day in advance uh, to, to, to prices and then uh, and then we hope that drivers uh, show up. And what I'm going to talk about is how we do this process of setting up those, uh, setting, setting up those right uh, prices. So it has a couple of different components. We need demand prediction. We need to know how, how much demand we're going to have the following day. We need traffic predictions. We need to know what the traffic is going to be the following day. And then we have kind of a model of how our real-time system behaves under different conditions, right? So we can think about, so. I, I removed all of the axes here, but, but this is uh, kind of the, uh, this is uh, speed, and this is kind of a ratio between demand and supply. And you can see that the blue area is where we have very good service. So if we have more demand than supply, we have slightly worse service. And if the city as a whole is very, very slow, it's going to be not so good service because it doesn't matter how many cars we put on the road. If the whole city is clogged, the car won't get to you really fast. So we, we do these predictions. Uh, you can see that these predictions are basically profit predictions. We kind of play with different components. So uh, we don't really, we're not married to any like specific prediction algorithm. Every, every single thing is just kind of like plug and play. Uh, but uh, that tells us how many, basically how many vehicles we need uh, tomorrow. And how many vehicles we need tomorrow is half the problem to actually getting, half, half the, the way to getting enough vehicles on the road. The other thing we need to figure out is how drivers respond uh, to promotions. Uh, if we have a good model that describes how drivers respond to promotions and we know exactly how many drivers we need at each point in time, we can predict uh, what would happen after different under different scenarios of promotions. And if we can predict it really well, it basically becomes a very, very simple linear uh, optimization problem, kind of cost minimization under the uh, constraints that we need to have at least at least that number of drivers. Uh, so, so again, everything is kind of modular and, and we, we plug things in. Uh, the funny thing or the interesting thing is that this is actually the driver's promo response model is one of the harder problems uh, to solve. There's a lot of academic papers about whether drivers behave uh, rationally, whatever rational uh, means when you're an economist or whatever rational means when you, when you learn uh, or when, when you're studying drivers. Uh, it's, a, it's a really hard problem, but uh, if you have a good prediction, then you can solve it. Uh, it, it simplifies everything else. Um, so 
one nice thing about thinking about kind of a whole transportation system as a system is that it gives us the ability to uh, look not just at the single vehicle level. We, we do the optimization over multiple vehicles and we study our effects over uh, kind of the whole system and, and you know, environmental effects and congestion effects and stuff like that. And one of the nice things about uh, trying to be very optimal is that it actually also has very nice environmental and, and kind of systemic effects. So what we have here is a, um, is a comparison about, uh, between how, how many miles uh, a vehicle rides uh, in order to take one passenger one mile, right? So usually a taxi on average for every single trip of one passenger does one mile empty, driving around looking for fares and stuff like that. Um, if you look at some of our competitors, but specifically Uber, there's a paper uh, published again uh, either late last year or earlier this year showing how many miles they ride empty on average for every single passenger mile that they do. And it's about between 0.6 and 0.8, depending on kind of the city and stuff like that. It's pro for New York, it's about 0.6 probably. Uh, what we, so in order to deliver one passenger one mile, we actually on average drive less than a mile because even on average, uh, our vehicles are at more than 100% capacity, which means that you know, if you compare kind of how efficient we are compared to, to, to taxis or some of our competitors, it's just so much less that it actually uh, has a negative uh, influence on congestion. And it's not just that it's less in general, it's even, the, the nice thing about it is that when uh, you look at kind of how this evolves over the time of day, so this is how many miles uh, a, a vehicle has to uh, drive or a driver has to drive in order to deliver, again, one passenger, one mile. Um, and so the nice thing that you see is that it goes down during congestion time. So it, it's not just that we're generally good for congestion. The interesting thing is that you can see that during congestion times, uh, when traffic uh, or when there's lots of people on trying to, to get on the road, we actually perform a lot better. And when you use kind of the high capacity vehicles optimized to do shared rides, uh, you can even get to uh, around half. So on every mile we drive, we actually deliver on average two people one mile towards their destination, which is uh, like four times better than, you know, four times better than taxis, more than one and a, uh, more, like more than three times better than kind of the, the regular uh, competition. Which means that overall we just have like a really nice uh, effect on uh, the environment, congestion, stuff like that. Um, so I know we have two more minutes, but I was speaking really fast, so <laughs> we're done. Actually, curious, just for my own benefit, how, how big is the company? How many people do you have? Like, how many, how many people do you have on your team to do this, which seems quite complex? So, to do this, uh, so we actually have three different data science teams. Uh, we have the, the, the team that does the routing algorithm with the real time, that solves the real time problem, and the data scientists also, the, the analysts measure stuff with them. Uh, they're about, I think, I don't know. Between eight and ten, it's growing really fast. Uh, we have two other data science teams: one to do the operational side, which is kind of what what I showed here, which uh, right now is about four and a half people, and uh, one to do uh, basically to do the growth, so uh, getting more people to use Via, getting people to use Via to do more. Uh, so that team is about eight people. About half of them are could be called data scientists. Do you have uh, questions? About how many miles per, um, per day does your average vehicle do, and how many passengers do you move per day comparing to a cab? Um, so I, I don't know if we can share that data exactly, uh, but but I, I would say that on average, um, a typical driver, so our drivers can, can log in and out of the platform as they choose. Some of them might work for an hour on the platform. Some of them may work for for a lot more. On average, I'd say they work between um, 
in New York for eight or nine hours uh, a day. I, that's that's probably about about right. Um, and you know, average traffic speeds are what eight miles an hour here, <laughs> give or take. So that gives you a sense of how many uh, vehicle miles they're traveling in a day on an average. Does that make sense? Um, um, your product is really good, but I have a question. When it comes to licensing to different states or different companies, how easy is it to set up? And can someone also use your system for something else like logistics or shipping? Like you are a transportation operating system. Like how easy is it to turnkey your infrastructure for something else? So we, we've worked really hard to make it uh, really simple to apply to, to a new geography uh, just for moving people. Um, at the moment, I think if we wanted to set up our system in Philadelphia, which is like a test that we've run, it takes us about an hour uh, to get it up and running. So in an hour, uh, we could have, we don't have real vehicles in Philadelphia, unfortunately, but we could have a simulation where we have simulated vehicles and, and we, could, well, we could use the VIA app to start booking rides uh, in, in Philadelphia and have you know, simulated cars come pick you up. So that can happen in an hour. That's quite an interesting process because if you know the VIA system, uh, we, we try to touch on it, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but we, we uh, route the passengers as well as the vehicles to each other, right? So we, we don't pick you up where you are, drop you off exactly where you want to go. You have to walk to a nearby, in Manhattan it's typically a corner, it doesn't have to be a corner, which we call a virtual bus stop. So it's an optimized pickup location and an optimized drop off location that helps us do the routing. And we give you a lot of very precise information about that physical location. So we'll say, we'll pick you up on the corner of 59th and Lexington in front of Bloomberg. And then you'll know exactly, you know, whatever it is on the northeast corner uh, in front of Bloomberg, and then you'll know exactly where to wait. And we actually create all, so in that hour, we create all that information too. We pull it out of a ton of different sources. Um, and then we will hire uh, a task rabbit or, or, you know, whatever, or a Columbia College uh, student to, uh, they're very cheap as it turns out, <laughs> to, um, um, <laughs> then go over this manually uh, using uh, other, other resources to refine it. But to, to just get it up and running is about an hour. Now to apply that to logistics, we haven't done that yet. We, we've thought about it. In, in theory, it should translate, but logistics tend to have some other properties that are, that are not that simple. Um, so, so, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I don't think it's immediate. I think it applies, but not immediate. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I was once using your product at like two in the morning in Brooklyn, and I was waiting doing? like a way long time. And it would be really nice at that point if I could just pay some more money to uh, get a car quicker. Mm -hmm. um, you're an economist. Why did you guys choose to not have varying prices? Uh, That's a good question. Great question. Yeah. Why do we choose to have? Uh, Static prices. Um, there's th th there's something to be said about kind of having a predictable experience, right, and transparent thing that you know what you're going to get exactly. Uh, there's something to be said about making prices a little bit more dynamic or creating an additional line of product that might be kind of you know you get a better experience if if you pay more. So it's it's a it's something that we kind of. Um, struggle with and, and discuss internally quite a bit. Um, and you know, so far, the, the kind of uh, focusing on the experience was a big thing, uh, or is a big thing. Well, I'd say a part of it has to do with the mission, right? So we, we started out really trying to build a public transit system that was dynamic, that was you know, in the first slide, that's what we talked about. And our feeling was that it isn't consistent with that brand, that when you really need a ride at 2 a.m. in the morning, we will charge you 3x whatever it is that's the basic price. So it isn't, that doesn't fit with your experience with a subway or a bus or like a public service, right? So th now the trade-off, of course, is you're take, trying to take the subway at 2 a.m. in the morning, you're probably waiting 10 minutes to clean up the subway. So, so it can't, you can't kind of win them all. Uh, so that was the trade-off that we try to make. And I think when we were first serving, we started as a commuter service in Manhattan between the Upper East Side and the Upside Midtown, and we, we expanded gradually. It made a lot of sense at that time that that's sort of how it works. Now we've got service at 2 a.m. in the morning between Brooklyn and Manhattan. You know, may, maybe that requires a different type of service. And so if you happen to follow our emails, one of the things that we're planning to launch over the next few weeks is a service called Via Express, which will allow us to do just that, to say, when you want to pay a little bit more, there's always Via. It's, you know, it's pretty much five bucks. Maybe it's six, maybe it's seven. You know, if you're going really long distance, we just can't do it for five. You can sort of see how efficient we are, which, you know, people always ask, how do we make money? Uh, so, you know, hopefully some of that data shows you how we can. Uh, but uh, even at $5 a ride. But 
you know, 2 a.m. in the morning between Brooklyn and Manhattan, it's very hard to do at 5. So maybe it's 6, maybe it's 7, maybe it's 8, but you've got to wait. Or if you're willing to pay more, well, okay, we've got VIA Express for you. So, you know, that, that might be a solution for how to bridge that, um, that gap. But it's a really, you know, we struggle with this. It's a tough branding question and a, and a mission question. There's a, someone who hasn't asked a question in here for us. Raise your right hand, Tom. Um, so I was hoping you could comment on some of the, over here, uh, the behavioral, um, interesting behavioral um, findings that you guys have had with the, the driver promo problem. I'm curious about, um, you know, some behavioral economics research. I'm not an economist, but uh, as, as I understand, has found that as you pay cab drivers more, for example, or as they, as they make more money, they may drive for less hours on those days. And if that's consistent with what you guys see? That's a great question. Uh, so there's a whole set of papers trying to study specifically taxi drivers in New York City because uh, that's where the data is. So that's what the farmers study. But the behavior of cab cabbies in New York City, uh, at some point, someone thought that it indicates that they have a revenue targeting behavior. So they want to make the $300 a day because they pay $100 a day for renting and, and cab and another 75 to 100 for gas. So they want to make an extra 100, 150, and then they go home. So on a day where it rains, uh, they finish it earlier, they go home. Um, we, so it's actually really hard to know if, uh, if that's exactly what we're seeing, because some of them claim that they do that, but some of them might claim that they do it on a weekly basis and not on a day basis. So we, uh, so that's one. The other is um, we are not the only game in town. And so um, we don't really directly observe their outside options. So what we might see is that the more we pay, the more likely they are to show up. And then it starts going down, even if they did have this behavior. So, so it's a long way to say um, that driver behavior is very complex uh, and it might have some component of revenue uh, targeting, and it also has the component of some people just showing up to work every morning, um, because not everyone actually optimizes every day and deciding, today I'm gonna go and do this because it's 20 cents an hour more. Um, and so, so it's, a, it's a very complex set of behavior. Let's do one last one, whoever has not asked a question. Hi, uh, thank you, that was a great presentation. Um, my question actually centers around the supply side as well. Is, is it true that every driver would have a different threshold for how much you would have to pay to get them out on the road? Or does that go into your um, promo uh, process uh, when determining what, what, what the promo is? Are there different levels of payment for each driver, basically? So it's a common thing among uh, uh, academic economists to know, to, to think, that people optimize and companies optimize uh, to that level. Um, I can say that I wish we could, but there's just no way to actually do that in a realistic world where uh, behavior is very complex. Uh, so, you know, sometimes, so, so, so driver pay could be dependent on many different things, how good they are and how much, you know, the type of their vehicle and, and, and uh, how likely they are to stay actually for the hours that we actually care about and stuff like that. So, so, uh, so there are some differences, but it's not to the level of, uh, it's, it's definitely not like that. Okay, thank you. Great, wonderful. Well, we'll be at uh, 8.05 and there's drinks and food waiting for us next door. We'll uh, you know, keep it at that, but thank you very much. We enjoyed it.